I'm going to talk about, um, yeah, as, as titled over here, structure and reality of uh, stimuli responsive nanocellulose interfaces. Um, that is work that we have done over the past, I would say, maybe eight, 10 years. And um, it is framed a little bit in um, um, the motivation to um, give some answers, uh, some ideas how to fight uh, global obesity. Uh, this is a map that is uh, updating and you see um, how the um, uh, world is getting bigger and um, the idea uh, of tackling that problem, of course, there are multiple of them. Um, we have um, tried a lot. Most of the stuff is of the ideas are um, not really working uh, simply because we are not, um, yeah, um, uh, um, we are not forcing ourselves to 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 really adhere to the rules. So um, the um, general idea is that um, uh, one um, has to over that we that we uh, uh, try to reduce overweight and obesity. Um, and there's a lot of ideas, as mentioned before. We have um, uh, ruled out fat as as a as an ingredient that is, is um, creating um, overrated obesity. We have, uh, we came up with artificial sweetness. And then of course, also uh, we have the discussion on fibers and fullness. Um, and um, more recently, um, people are talking about uh, interaction with mucus and biofilms in the, in, the, in the small intestine. And what I would like to um, um, come up um, or what I would like to discuss over here is, is um, actually uh, playing around with uh, the lipid digestion and the lipid uptake. Um, basically rethinking a little bit the role of fat. Um, and that was introduced 10 years ago by uh, Matt Golding and Tim Wooster at that time at uh, CSIRO in Melbourne. Um, um, basically um, saying that when we have um, uh, fat in our food, we actually also are able to, um, uh, our body is able to induce uh, um, um, satiety hormones that are going to stop up, uh, eating. The problem is um, that uh, we take up fat, it is digested um, uh, in, in the stomach and then small and, and then in the small intestine. So the problem over here is more uh, that we have to get the fat to the right place. And uh, this concept is put together in, in the concept of the iron break. Um, uh, so that uh, once the lipid is reaching uh, the, the, um, the small intestine, we have the triggering of these uh, satiety hormones. So that is, of course, happening normally at the end of the meal. We would actually like to do that at the beginning of the meal. So um, having actually fat going there, uh, not digested, and that is now the, 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 the problem that we have, that basically um, it will be digested in the stomach and then uh, goes already pre-digested in the small intestine. So it's really just not working um, when we have the first bite of fat uh, that we are eating. And um, the idea is now to generate lipid emulsions that are going to survive the stomach. So that is... Um, an idea that was put up 10 years ago. Um, we followed that um, a bit and we teamed up actually also with people from the university hospital next door. Um, and when, you, when you're going to hear some uh, um, um, emergency vehicle coming, arriving over here, it's just simply because I, my office is just next to them, the emergency room. Um, so the, the idea was then carried on as I said, with people with the, from the University Hospital in, here in, in Zurich. And these are um, images of um, different emulsions and actually the uh, gastric content uh, volume-wise uh, when feeding or when putting people in an in a MRI device. And um, uh, what you see over here in the white uh, areas, this is basically the stomach. It is filled uh, with, um, uh, with a fatty solution an emulsion system and it's back down and depending on the structure, um, uh, one has different gastric volume over time. So that is monitored over two hours, three hours. Um, and uh, we see that actually the, the structure is, is very much um, uh, changing um, over this time and actually also do, does the 
the emptying of the stomach. So here we have already an indication that we have a control um, on um, uh, the, the food um, digestion, the, the stability of the emulsion, uh, controlled by the stability of the emulsion. Good, so that was um, a little bit of the, um, uh, the, the framing and indication that um, by the, the designing food, uh, we, we have a direct influence on, for example, the, the gastric volume, the emptying of the, of the stomach. Now the problem is how to make these, um, uh, these um, uh, emulsion systems so that they're stable in the gastric environment, but they're breaking down in the um, intestinal environment. And uh, uh, what we have to consider here is the different pHs, the mechanical stresses that we have in the stomach, even though I'm not going to talk about that. Um, we, we have mucus um, uh, in, in both um, stomach and intestine. We have uh, changes of chronic strength and of, of course also temperature is body temperature. So from the food that we take maybe at 20 degrees or whatever, uh, it is going to be heated up to um, uh, 37 degrees when we don't have fever. Um, and so these are a lot of boundary conditions um, to uh, basically have these emulsions stable. And um, what I'm going to discuss a little bit in the following are actually four steps uh, that we um, made to go from not only the design of the emulsion, where we actually will look also a little bit more deeper in neutron reflectivity measurements, um, but we also um, would like to understand how this emulsion is then stable in in vitro in environment. And then of course, also if the entire idea is actually working um, in vivo. So here uh, at the very end, I will also present you some experimental data that we have obtained from humans and from rats. Okay, um, how to make this emulsion? Or let's say the interface of this emulsion. Well, um, uh, classically, uh, a lot of, um, food emulsions are stabilized by proteins. Um, uh, th this is um, a summary of um, um, the adsorption of proteins, conformation changes to network building of a gel or um, more glassy uh, interface that is stabilizing the emulsion. There's a lot of work on that. Um, I always like to re refer to the PhD thesis of, of Benjamins from Wageningen University who really nicely put that together uh, some 20 years ago. Um, but there's, there's a lot of extensive work on, on that area uh, existing. Um, the other uh, system that became a little bit more popular over the last, I would say, 10 years, as you see also here with the, um, the citations, is uh, our particles. And um, when you look into literature, there's actually a whole bunch of particles that have been investigated. So starch, um, uh, flavonoid crystals or particles, ketene, seen, and um, in particular cellulose and or cellulose nanocrystals. Um, I'm going to stick with the cellulose nanocrystals um, um, for the for the rest of my talk, um, as we in the beginning of the project actually screened the others, but found that the cellulose nanocrystals are most probably the most um, yeah, a potent uh, candidate for stabilizing the emulsion, in particular when mixing them with proteins, as we will see later. Um, there's a lot of work done in, in that area over the last 10 years, and um, I just mentioned two review articles that are both very recent that are um, um, putting these uh, work together. So the first one is from the Leeds group, uh, Saka and Dickinson, and then later on, um, we also had a review on that, but I also like to uh, mention that others like um, uh, Kaloshnikova also have written nice overviews on the last 10 years of this research. Good. So what we uh, now looked into a little bit more in detail is um, that we used um, uh, crystalline uh, nanocellulose uh, or uh, um, um, yeah, and uh, modified them uh, in different ways. So what we see over here, so this is all work that we have um, done over the, over the last years. We used unmodified cellulose, we methylated them or esterified them. And um, uh, the unmodified one is, is relatively less surface active. So here you do see changes in the adsorption, uh, basically by the addition of the salt. Uh, with the methylated one in the middle, 
uh, we see that um, um, methylation actually increases the adsorption of the of the of the particles at the interface, uh, increasing the surface tension, the surface pressure. And with the esterified material, it's a little bit more tricky because they really just have to spread by by solvent and will, as we see later on, uh, build a relatively patchy layer. But that is the zoo of the cellulose particles that we used, and we, I mean, modified them. Uh, in different ways, so uh, basically playing around with the hydrophobicity of the material and um, um, uh, looked into their adsorption, their rheology, and their structure. And uh, well, the first, um, a very brief uh, uh, introduction to the method that we use for the uh, interfacial rheology. So this is the bicount setup that we have uh, developed um, uh, some years ago, where we basically measure elasticity, viscoelasticity, viscosity of this adsorption layer uh, between oil and water or just between water and, and air. With all these cables that you see uh, or tubings that you see on the, on the left hand side, we are changing the environmental conditions. So this is basically our little stomach or intestine that we are using. So here we can change pH, we can uh, add lipases and um, uh, increase temperature to, to see what is going to happen um, with these layers when we are going to physiological conditions. Um, and one example over here is beta lactoglobulin, so a protein that we um, adsorb at the interface uh, between oil and water. So we see G prime, GW prime, so elastic and storage modulus um, as function of time. And we did a lot of now steps uh, that are um, sort of yeah, linked to the to digestion. So we heated up to uh, uh, 37 degrees, we added, uh, we, we reduced the pH, and then we added pepsin. So you see, for all these steps, actually, the interfacial layer structure is um, always becoming lesser and weaker in signal. Um, and um, eventually, after uh, a few hours, uh, completely uh, is, is destroyed. So that is something that we actually don't want in, in this situation, so that the emulsion is actually broken and digested already in gastric conditions. So here, we are not going to bring these emulsions into the small intestine. Um, now, um, a, a little bit closer look to the methylated uh, nanocrystalline cellulose that we have used. So we have here, um, again, the plot of the surface pressure um, as function of um, different methylation steps. And we see that with increasing methylation, uh, the cellulose goes to the interface and um, reduces surface tension or increases actually surface pressure. Material is normally um, a few uh, nanometers width and the length is about 10 times of that. Um, so we have rod-like aggregates that are um, now sitting at the interface, establishing a layer there. and. Um, what is also in, uh, important to, to see is, uh, or uh, actually a benefit for us, is that these meth methylated celluloses, they do a thermal gelation, normally in bulk, that it is, it's, it's around at 50 degrees Celsius. At interfaces, it's far lower, um, so it's 22 degrees. And what we see here is an inc when we increase the temperature, um, we see that G prime, G double prime is also increasing. So here we have a thermal gelation that actually also helps us to stabilize the um, emulsion uh, with, a, um, uh, with a layer of, of um, cellulose around. And when we look to the right, um, the graph over here shows G prime, G double prime for the different uh, methylation steps. And you see that um, this thermal gelation is um, helping us um, a lot, in particular with the um, material that has a, a, the highest methylation step. So we start with the three, four, and five um, at the very end, on the very right end of the, of the graph. So um, this is a benefit that we have, uh, certainly when, when uh, trying to um, stabilize the emulsions. And now I'm just showing you the same experiment that we have done now with the methylated cellulose and the beta lactoglobulin together under gastric conditions. So it's the same experiment that we've done with, this, with, um, with, the, um, with the better lactoglobulin alone. But what you see over here is that in every step that we do accept maybe the addition or the change of the pH, um, the uh, layer is actually getting stronger. So 
um, reactivated cellulose, it builds up um, the, um, a layer that is a composite layer with a better lactoglobulin. Temperature increase induces a thermogelation um, and the addition of pepsin, so um, gastric um, um, environment, um, is actually not changing things at all. So here we, we have a nice proof that, or at least from the interfacial rheology, that the material is really um, um, resistance against um, the, the gastric environment. So the emulsion stays intact. Um, and now um, uh, let's turn a little bit to um, the neutron reflectivity measurements that we have done for these materials. So what you see over here uh, is well the normal um, reflectivity curve as function of the, of the scattering vector. And um, we don't have too much features over here. So the curves are relatively flat, um, uh, which we actually all see for protein systems, um, uh, at least food protein systems um, throughout the way. Uh, but what we are going to see is that with the thermogelation, actually also the layer structure is, is changing. And um, with, I mean, you know, uh, playing around with fitting, uh, we, we basically can come up with um, a model on the right hand side so that we have at 22 degrees Celsius, some of the material sitting at the interface approximately 30 angstrom thick, but a relatively diffuse layer uh, penetrating into the bark. And when uh, we are now going to the higher temperatures, so 70, uh, 37 degrees, we have a more compact layer that is thicker, um, about 150 angstroms in thickness. So here, um, we, we already see the thermal gelation is kicking in and helping us to build a layer structure that is um, um, protecting the interface. Now in the, in the next step, or in the next graph over here, um, we put together the experiments with the different ingredients that we have. So here we, we are talking, or we have um, um, actually the pure water-air interface. We have the beta lactoglobulin layer. We have the pure methylated um, crystallized cellulose, um, then with beta lactoglobulin uh, together, and uh, in the in the final state, actually also the compressed one. And um, depending from the um, from the reflectivity curves, so the upper right, um, we again calculated uh, scattering length density, and uh, basically came up with the cartoon in the middle. Uh, where we have the better lactoglobulin layer, about 20 angstroms, the methylated cellulose, 120, 150, um, and then the composite layer, um, the same um, thickness. So we have uh, indication that the better lactoglobulin is really used, is the cement between the, the cellulose, and we can, even by compressing, not really changing that structure too much. Okay. Um, so that is a, a little bit of um, the uh, situation for the methylated cellulose. So this is actually the cartoon now here in the middle. And I also would like to show you the two other materials that we have used, the modified and the esterified material, um, and try to give a little bit of a summary what we have observed there. So maybe for the starting with the unmodified uh, material here, uh, we see a relatively slow adsorption uh, so it really takes hours, and that is um, most probably also the reason why uh, there are sometimes indications in the literature that it does not observe. Actually, it does, but you really have to wait hours. Um, uh, you can increase the adsorption by salt, uh, so that is uh, something that um, uh, tremendously um, yeah, pushes the uh, particles to the interface. But actually, it's a relatively discontinuous layer, and the coverage is very small. So basically, for the idea that we had, it's, it's not appropriate. The middle one, the methylated one, as discussed before, um, is, um, is a monolayer that we can, with a thermal gelation, um, uh, push into, into a multilayer structure, actually also with a uh, better lactoglobulin. Um, as a composite then being relatively stable or actually very stable for gastric environment. We would see that in a, in, in a few slides down the road. The last one, the esterified ones, is um, we already can spread that with solvent so they don't absorb from the bark um, due to the hydrophobicity. 
Um, and uh, here we have a system that actually has a relatively high contact angle. Um, and um, uh, as a result, we, we see actually a system that is more aggregated and, um, um, and building clusters. Interesting, and, and here, um, again, uh, same system, but now um, um, microscopy images. So the, for the unmodified, you see actually nice um, distribution, but still it's not really a continuous layer. Methylated, a more dense one, and the esterified, um, the clustered one. Um, I'm, I mean, in the, in the lower row, you see actually the rheology signal of the material, and I really would like to point out to the lower right one for the esterified one. Here we see a Maxwell kind of behavior of the adsorption layer, and I think that is one of the very few examples um, uh, where that is going to happen. So normally it is just a gel structure that we observe for these kind of materials at interfaces, and here um, most probably due to the, um, uh, the contact angle and the um, we will have a situation that the material is behaving as a Maxwell field. But that is more a little bit of a side note. Okay, and now the question, does that stuff really help us to survive um, with a droplet in the uh, gastric environment and in the um, uh, intestine environment? So um, what we have done here um, in the first step are in vitro studies. Uh, we used um, lipases, we also used mucus, and we looked into the structuring of the food during, during the digestion. So that was done with an immersion system that was MCT, so medium chain triglyceride at uh, water systems, and we also used um, recombinant top gastric lipases for this experiment. So the first experiment is actually a microfluidics one. Uh, so we uh, made our emulsion. And we kept uh, the emulsion droplets covered with um, cellulose and beta lactic globulin in little traps, as you see um, in the uh, picture on the right hand side over here. Um, and then we are changing. We were changing from the uh, generation mode, uh, making the droplet to the digestion mode, and we added now um, different um, first gastric and then pancreatic uh, um, lipases to. Um, uh, digest the, the, the droplets in the trap. And what you see uh, in the low, in the lower row is, is basically a filled trap on the left-hand side, then um, uh, coalescence, the digestion of the, of the droplets, and then eventually to the far right, um, uh, disappearing of the, of the oil droplets. So here then the digestion would be over. Um, a little more uh, in a, um, uh, with a, um, a, a transit way, actually, uh, you can see these with now two videos. The first one on the left hand side is, is starting, so it shows um, the droplet in one trap. We have the gastric environment when nothing is happening, and then in the pancreatic uh, environment, the droplet is disappearing. So, simply um, saying that, well, in the gastric environment, it survives, and once we switch to the pancreatic environment, it doesn't. Um, the next uh, movie is more or less doing the same thing. So we have the gastric environment, nothing is really happening. And then in the pancreatic environment is actually um, the droplet is breaking down rap rapidly, not only having coalescence, um, just showing the movies again, um, but now in parallel. Uh, so you see gastric, nothing is happening, at least uh, minor things, maybe coalescence and pancreatic it does dissolve. Um, the picture is put together um, here in, in, a, in a graph. So we see in the, in the gastric environment uh, relatively small changes of uh, droplet by diameter. We have a few coalescence effects over here. So that means that the diameters are becoming larger. But once we go into the pancreatic environment within, let's say, 15 minutes or, or even less, the, the droplets are all digested. So basically, the achievement that we survive the stomach and um, have the, the, the release of the fat in the, in the small intestine is, 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 is given. And now last thing for the, for, for the last few minutes is, uh, does it work with humans and with rats? And um, so uh, for that, uh, we went back, um, as mentioned before, to the university hospital 
uh, running M MRI signals. Um, and uh, what you see here on the left hand side is um, the stomach, so the white uh, circle with the, with the yellow circle or um, a circle fence there. So the white material or the white image is the uh, fat emulsion, black is air. And now with the um, um, data processing, we actually can also say what is fat and what is water. So the blue one is water, and you see that the fat layer is red. Uh, on top of the um, of the of the emulsion, um, sorry, of the of the stomach in um, uh, content over here, and then black again is 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 uh, is air. So that is a, a whole bunch of um, calculation and procedure. I'm not going to uh, look into that into detail. Actually, also um, not really my competence over here. Uh, what we have now is. Um, um, and um, in the end, these these figures. So this is uh, actually the stomach of the first author of the paper that is down there, um, and she was drinking these three emulsion systems, and one stabilized with beta lactoglobulin, met methylated cellulose, and nanocrystalline cellulose. And what we um, now can nicely see when we scan through the uh, with the MRE through the uh, through the stomach that we have. For the beta ductal globally in the creaming, so here the emulsion is breaking up, it is, it is digested. With the methylated cellulose, we have a dilution effect. And um, with the nanocrystalline cellulose, we have a structuring. So here, um, um, the, 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 um, uh, um, the situation with the, with the uh, uh, beta ductal globally basically is the dissolution of the, of the um, uh, emulsion, so we have uh, digestion going on and for the two others we don't and uh, we have then now modern monitored that actually also with um, the gastrointestinal responses so we looked into uh, triglycerides in the blood the um, uh, plasma cck and the uh, gallbladder volume and what you see here is um, uh, a very rapid response uh, to the whey protein isolate so better ductal globally and simply saying well the immersion is breaking down we have uptake of fat, um, the triglycerides are going up, satiety um, signal is coming up um, as, as well very rapidly. Um, when we go to the methylated cellulose, it is all delayed and flattened. So basically what we would like to uh, have to see. And when we go even to these very uh, high methylated nanocrystalline cellulose, the signal is almost not there. So that means that here um, we don't sense any of the material. So it is so stable. Uh, that it is even not digested um, um, in, in, um, uh, in, in this time frame that we have. have with it. So that uh, basically also says, well, with monitoring, manipulating the interfacial structure of the, of the emulsion, we, we really can um, trigger different um, um, uh, gastrointestinal responses, so hormone releases, um, um, fatty acids in the blood and uh, by that the method um, I think we can conclude it's it's um, showing that with the structuring we can really monitor and and, and um, um, uh, control the uh, fat take up. Um, last picture is with uh, accumulated food intake with rats so you cannot do that with humans feeding them for two days or even more with these emulsions. Um, uh, so we have done that with rats, and you see that with the whey protein um, stabilized uh, food intake, basically they're eating constantly. Um, with the uh, nanocrystalline cellulose, the black one, um, they are eating, but then they are not changing or not, um, eating more after the um, after two hours or three hours. While with methylated cellulose, um, we have lesser food intake compared to the two others. Um, but it's actually also um, relatively rapidly at the beginning and then stays constant. So here again, the two uh, cellular systems basically show in a different way, um, uh, I mean, for individually differently, um, that food intake can be actually controlled by, by the interfacial structure. Okay, and with that, um, I'm going to finish. Uh, so what we... Uh, I hope that what I could show you is that um, by designing interfacial layers, 
um, with different materials, in particular here with uh, proteins and celluloses. Um, uh, one can um, uh, generate emulsions that are um, differently behaving towards in both in vitro and in vivo gastric and interstellar environment. And by that, uh, helping to uh, structure first the, the, um, the, um, the food emulsion that we have, and by that, um, also controlling um, their digestion and uh, the lipid take up uh, eventually in the small intestine. And um, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to uh, finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I'm sure all my colleagues enjoyed it as well. And uh, we have a few questions. So yes, sure. um, I'm uh, going to start by asking Lawrence, uh, we have a few minutes so I can actually ask the, uh, the person to uh, ask the question live. Yep. Uh, Lawrence, are you? Yeah. Here? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, Peter, nice talk. Uh, uh, it was just a curiosity you showed that the, there was a huge difference in uh, gelation temperature at the interface and in the bulk. And I was wondering whether you know where it comes from. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, that the methylated cellulose is gelling at higher temperatures. That, that's uh, an effect that is um, as, um, that, that you basically exclude um, fluid volume um, in the environment of the, of the, of the cellulose. And I, um, I mean, that is working in bulk. And I think as we are constraining uh, the system to more or less 2D um, by the adsorption, um, we have less, um, let's say, free space available, and then it actually kicks in earlier. Um, so it needs less temperature increase to do so. Um, but that is really speculation. I, we, we never, um, I mean, went into that into full detail. Um, it, it's, yeah, a, a little bit, uh, I think that the, the, the problem when you go from 3D to 2D, um, that, that some of the, yeah, let's say environmental conditions are, are, are changing. So the same thing with, I mean, actually also the rheology response that we almost just see um, a less, I mean, gel-like or um, uh, rubber-like behavior, but never um, uh, behavior like a, like a Maxwell fluid. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Um, Tommy, uh, Tommy also has uh, a question on the reflectance data. So, Tommy, you want to ask the reflectance data yeah. question? So, so, Peter, in the first curve that you show on the neutron reflectivity yeah. on the cellulose layer, it seems in, it implies that there are two layers. Uh, there is a kink in the SLD profile. Sorry to be very detailed. But yeah, 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 no, 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 no problem. I'm, I'm, um, so, yeah. so do you think that the layer next to the surface is denser or different than from the more extended layer? Because it seems that, that, that there is a difference in the... Yeah, this is, um, um, so that, no, not that one. Well, I mean, you mean this one over here or the? No, 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 no. Okay, let's yeah. see one, one more, one more up. Yeah. Um, that one over here. No, no I think there was. Uh, that's the beta lactam I mean, the other one. That one, yeah. That that one, that, that one we, it yeah. implies to me that it there is a because you see like a. A plateau layer, and then there is something yeah. Uh, yeah. wide distribution. Yeah. I mean, that is um, um, well. You know that better than me. I mean, getting a, a final structure out of these uh, yeah. data um, yeah. needs a little bit of art and um, and um, imagination. And um, we we basically came up with this uh, conclusion or with a drawing in, in um, using also these AFM images that we have. Yeah, um, right. and, and so um, the, the layer structure at the, at the top, I think, uh, as you said, is indeed a little bit denser than when you go into the uh, closer to the bulk. Um, 
so and yeah, playing around with these uh, parat uh, um, fitting. I mean, you can basically yeah, yeah, shift yeah, yeah, around. I, I mean, density yeah. and 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 layer thickness and roughness. Yeah. Um, I, I think still there is um, always a little bit of interpretation yeah, yeah. Uh, left, and maybe other uh, mm. other ways to say. But um, we we know or we always do these. Uh, um, or did that um, fitting also having the uh, AFM images in, in mind? And um, uh, that's the way to do it, I think. Yeah. Maybe another contrast also so could help. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. There's a there's a question from Kirsten. Kirsten, would you like to ask her? Ask it. Yeah, this is a little bit of uh, uh, another track. But I was thinking about if uh, if these emulsions can be sort of too stable for. Uh, a quality in the in the in, in in the perception and the sensory yeah. of yeah. the. Yeah. Oh. No, th this is this is this is um, um, uh, two things that I have to to say over there. The MCT oil that we used in the first experiments, it was sort of a very creamy emulsion. So um, um, you cannot drink too much of those. Um, then you throw up. Um, so that basically says how tasty they are, um, and um, uh, the the situation with the with the MC, uh, MCC uh, with the methylated nanocrystalline cellulose, there the emulsion is so stable um, that you basically just eat a filler. So um, it's almost I mean eventually yes, but uh, I mean it's 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 almost impossible to to penetrate that. Um, um, that layer in in, in given time. I, of course, we haven't uh, considered any uh, motion and mixing in the stomach. Uh, so from that point, maybe it's also different. But I mean, coming back to your your, your question, uh, from the sensory, the stuff is all not nice. Um, and the the idea initially, or let's say, uh, how we actually. Um, um, yeah, think we're thinking of, of of using the material is sort of a um, uh, in, in in form of a salad dressing or something that is um, um, not a drink that you where you where you drink two hundred milliliters before the before starting eating or something like that because then uh, I think um, the meal is spoiled so we basically have to camouflage that uh, emulsion system in a way that. Um, that people are still drinking it. And th that is really a big problem. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peter. There is also a question related to microfluidics and how you did the in situ digestion work. Mm -hmm. And actually I'm gonna expand it a little bit and we have only one minute left before the next speaker. But okay. if, uh, um, what, what happens between the gastric and the uh, intestinal? Uh, do, you, do you wash? Uh, the digested uh, material out, uh, or everything stays there. And uh, and Tommy is asking also if you mm -hmm. had bile salts in the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, all these experiments they were uh, done as closely as possible. And I think uh, a big difference to most of the in vitro studies is that that we kept the digested. I mean, we we wash out the digested material in the um, in the in the gastric situation, but there is nothing too much. Not too much is happening, so everything is still left, but structured by the gastric environment before we are going uh, into the um, pancreatic environment. Um, so it's 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 really not um, that we do two different steps. We do as it is going to happen in in real one after the other. Um, so that and that actually also. In, uh, um, shows that the pre-structuring that we have of the very stable emulsion in the stomach is has an uh, enormous impact on the on the uh, pancreatic digestion. So um, it would be certainly differently when 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 we expose the uh, the emulsions uh, individually first to the uh, or parallel to the gastric and then to the intestine situation. Yeah. So it's it's really in one after the other, like like it happens uh, in vivo. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Peter.